now. Uh, good afternoon uh, to everybody from India and good morning to Carl. Uh, uh, we are here uh, as part of uh, a course on travel writing, uh, on Indian travel writing actually. And uh, uh, as part of the course, we have had several interactions with distinguished scholars. And uh, this is the second part of this interaction. And we are very, very glad to have with us uh, Dr. Carl Thompson. Uh, Dr. Carl Thompson is, of course, one of the most important scholars in this uh, particular area. And uh, uh, his books in this field have included Travel Writing, uh, the new critical idiom series, which has been mandatory reading, Carl, for the students of this course. That's published Thank in you, 2011. Thank you. Right. Uh, it's also uh, published uh, The Suffering Traveler and the Romantic Imagination from OUP 2007. Uh, as editor, he has published The Routledge Companion to Travel Writing 2015, uh, Shipwreck in Art and Literature, that's, that's a very interesting uh, title, uh, uh, Images and Interpretations from Antiquity to the Present Day, Routledge 2013, uh, Romantic Area, Era, Shipwreck Narratives and Anthology, this is 2007. Uh, at present, uh, Carl is at the University of uh, Surrey and uh, uh, has joined in September 2017. Previously, he's been at St. Mary's University, Twickenham. Prior to that, at uh, Nottingham Trent University. And uh, between 2000 and 2003, he was junior research fellow in the English at Trinity College, Oxford. So, Carl. Welcome to this course and welcome virtually to India. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. And I, I hope I've only made one visit ever to India um, and I, I visited Kolkata and then Bhubaneswar. And I hope, I hope to get back again at some point. So it was, right, I, I hope so after the pandemic uh, gets over. Uh, yeah. Right, so Carl, uh, I just explained this to, uh, for, uh, to you and also to the other uh, people in the session that this is primarily meant as an interactive session for uh, first hour students so that I'll put their questions uh, to you first and then I'll open up uh, the floor for other people to put in their questions. You might put them on the chat box if you so want and I'll put them to Carl, right? Or if, uh, and Carl, please let me know when uh, you run out of time so that I can then bring this discussion to a close. Sure, right. yes. All right. Okay, Carl, uh, I'll start off the session with a few questions that uh, the students have already sent in. Mm. Uh, one of the things that many of them are, have a slight problem with is this, you know, this very broad canvas of travel writing as mm. uh, is suggested as an all-inclusive genre, mm. right? So uh, many of them have asked whether, you know, diasporic accounts, climate migration fictions, uh, in the way you've talked about the ethnographic texts, also in many cases, fantasies. Uh, one student has popped up with a question, if there's a travelogue about El Dorado, which blatantly does not exist, would that also be part of a travel writing course? If travel writing is such a broad canvas, then isn't there a problem of theorization in itself? Uh, and I think your students are exactly spot on with <laughs> recognizing that problem um as many of them i'm sure have I think, discovered for themselves it's almost sort of obligatory to begin any discussion of travel writing or, or introduction to travel writing with some sort of necessary framing of the problems of definition um because um, i think peter hume another sort of foundational travel writing scholar puts it i mean if you're just talking about texts that either depict or represent travel or come out of travel that's almost every text and so you right. get this, and, and there are even some sort of, um, um, I've forgotten who it is now, but there's a couple of French theorists who almost see the point of writing is itself a form of travel, because the purpose of writing, of mm -hmm. course, is to transmit messages beyond the face-to-face -face scenario. So is all writing travel? And of course, once you're there, you have a, a definition so broad that it's no use for anything. Um, the, the problem is, is that I suppose travel is interwoven into texts in all sorts of ways. All sorts of texts will depict travel or touch upon travel, will help to shape ideas about travel or will help to shape ideas about foreign places. 
Um, many of those texts will depict journeys or places that are unfamiliar to the reader. Um, and so, so unfortunately, it is a very loose assemblage that you have to sort of work with, I think. Um, so I've always been very drawn to Jan Vaughan's sort of dual, dualistic, almost uh, definition of travel writing, which again, I'm sure many of your students have, have encountered. And um, Jan Vaughan makes uh, the very useful distinction between a very large umbrella term that he calls travel writing, and then more precise, sort of much more pluralistic, precise set of subgenres within it that sort of overlap much more, but are, can be really quite different from each other. So, 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 so that I've always, ever since I read Jan Bourne's session, I thought, oh, yeah, that makes sense to me. You know, this umbrella term of a lot of things that can be travel writing and are sort of loosely travel writing with a more percent size of the 18th century exploration account, the um, a certain sort of pilgrimage account. I, I gather from what I've been travel writing as a, as a tradition of Indian pilgrimage accounts. And mm -hmm. I, I suspect within the different language traditions, they will form their own coherent sort of genres, really. So I, so I think there's no way around the complexity of it uh, and the sort of sense of an interaction between you know, lots of interacting subgenres, if you like, which will connect with each other because they're themed around a place or themed around a type of travel or around travel generally. Um, I suppose I often think that the other issue to think about here is, is it also it depends on what questions you're interested in asking, because obviously we come to a genre sort of with a set of research questions usually, you know, and, and so for some research questions, the category needs to be broadened out beyond, if you like, a, a very narrow definition of travel writing. So for example, say you're interested in the, what, you know, Saeed would call, Edward Saeed would call the imagined geographies of place. And those imagined geographies, of course, will be fashioned by travel accounts and by like sort of fictions of other places, you know, so Heart of Darkness will, along with, um, you know, Stanley, actually physically traveling through Africa in through the dark continent. You have a work like uh, Heart of Darkness, which is a sort of very much a fictional account. And so for those sort of questions that are often very relevant to travel writing studies, you need to be aware that, you know, the imagined geography is not created just by a sort of um, one type of travel writing or, you know, so, so, you, so, so you get, it, partly, part, another factor to, put, to, to weave in is, is the questions you are asking. Uh, what is it you're trying to find out and, and concerning yourself with? So yeah, so I think I think it is a very broad uh, field. It's almost impossible to police its parameters completely, uh, but you can be more precise about particular subgenres within it. And I think you, I think it's probably I should add to that also. You know, there is a sort of rough consensus that at the core of the genre is this sort of first person. Uh, theoretically, nominally, ostensibly non-fictional account of actually going to a place. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's certainly in the Western tradition. I'd be interested to know if that's the same in sort of some of the many Indian traditions you, you will all be more familiar with. But yeah, that first person account is often seen as being central to the genre. Um, and, and that certainly in, in, in the sort of that's what, the, what you can loosely call the Western tradition. I mean, that first person account has a more limited history than you would think as well. There isn't, there aren't a lot of those produced in the ancient period. They're not a lot of those, not that many are produced in the medieval period, but then they suddenly become more prominent mm -hmm. uh, with the sort of that age of discovery and incipient colonization that you get from sort of Columbus onwards. So there is a sort of core of the genre in the Western tradition there that, you know, almost everybody agrees that is travel writing. If someone goes a place and writes about it and it, it ostensibly is telling the truth, though of course truth telling in travel writing is another thorny topic. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, so, so anyway, so I suppose my, 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 to, to, to recap, yeah, I, I have a sort of, I, I try and keep in dialogue a sort of umbrella term that is very broad and then a more focused looking at particular subgenres where you can often map the histories, the um, particular social scenarios that a particular sub subgenre comes out of. Right. It's how I handle that question. But the, que the question asker is entirely right. It's, it's <laughs> thank very, you. Thank you. Uh, let me move on to the next question. Uh, uh, one of our students has asked Are travelogues exclusionary tropes in the guise mm -hmm. of inclusive stories about diverse cultures? In most mm -hmm. narratives, we find the speaker passing quick judgments and comments and agendas upon encountering new destinations, people, cultures, resulting in exclusion between the us and the them. I see that mm. in your book too, you've raised this question about the you know, dubious moral status and the 
discomfort about travel writing. Uh, so how would you respond to that? Um, first of all, saying again, it's a great question and the, the, the student in question has um, identified a core thorny area of travel writing and, and travel writing studies. Um, I, I would agree, in a sense, I would basically agree with the premise of the question, but with some qualifications, quite important qualifications, in a sense that that imbalance of power that the student is recognizing is always potentially there in travel writing. It's always sort of implicit in travel writing. You know, you, the account that you're reading has been shaped by one person, or uh, shaped by a particular writer or set of writers. Uh, in representing other places, they have a sort of representational power to sort of distort, to warp, or just to see inevitably through their, even if they're trying to be as honest as possible, they, they're always seeing through a particular set of lenses. Um, and, and so I think there's always a need. To... Please, please mute yourself, whoever that is, please. Uh, I'm sorry, Carl. I, I think... Is there a question? I can't tell if it's a question. So. No, 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 it's not a question. Somebody who's put on the microphone. Oh, okay, yes, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. All right. That's right, no worries, no worries at all. Um, yeah, so, so, so there is always that problem. There is all that, always that imbalance. There is always that power involved. So it's that always makes travel writing a potentially problematic form. And of course, that inherent dimension of travel writing has certainly in the West particularly since the age of Columbus often sort of intersected then with actual material power so that the sort of like the representational imbalance and the material structures around it the actual military economic power can go can dovetail together so that if you like people can be um, very equipped to pass quick dismissive derogatory judgments which then sort of get written into discourse become supposedly truth and knowledge um, and then like colonial policy is decided on it. So, th so there are all these problematic ways in which travel writing uh, has inherently that sort of potential power imbalance and connects with power structures quite historically, quite clearly. Against that though, I suppose I would want to make a point that, you know, on the one hand, what you're dealing with is the problem, inherent problem of representation. You know, if you represent someone else, there's always an imbalance there, but it is often the case that representation has to happen. You know, you know there, there are travel writing there are enough interesting counter examples i think where you can say well people have tried to um plead for people on the other side of the world um to, to recognize their plight you know and that that that, that if like that counter tradition it, whilst it's more minor is as old as sort of perhaps the western colonial tradition as well if you think of the uh the debates in spain very quickly about you know are are native americans being mistreated you know mm -hmm you need you need the other side of the coin and travel writing can be the other side of the coin it can be harnessed um to represent people to try and to try and rectify mis poor knowledge inaccurate knowledge to try and represent the case of other people and obviously it would be better in if we had a sort of perfect communication system whereby those peoples were representing themselves but there will inevitably always be situations where some people can't represent themselves so you need someone to represent them so so travel writing can be harnessed that way any representation of course is problematic it needs to be read with a sort of an appreciation of inevitably even the very best attempts to be accurate are going to be framed by a particular perspective but i think you know once you make that allowance you know that in some ways you know there are there are perhaps there are no perfect forms of representation but there sometimes are less imperfect forms of representation mm -hmm. and there are forms of representation that can be aware to try to be sort of tactful aware of, of their own uh, complex so 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 that just complicates it. i think the, the, the general drift of the question is entirely right but there are these qualifying complicating factors about you know sometimes the places need to be or communities need to be represented when they can't represent themselves people can do, um, people can do um, you know, it's a long, reasonably long tradition of people in travel writing trying to do their best to counter the stereotypes and to counter their own inevitable sort of skews of biases. So, so there is a sort of, I think, an honourable counter tradition in travel writing. For all that the general tenor of the question is also true and very important to keep in mind. Right. There's one question which has come in this mm. this morning, and that's that's interesting because this comes from a 
girl who's just <coughs> written that she's been a little disappointed reading your book and the examples okay. you've been giving because all of them are taken from Western texts. He say, yeah. She says that if you publish the next edition, you know, if you could bring in some other perspectives and texts as well. So, uh, and the other thing that she's asked is why you talk about this as being travel writing is essentially uh, reflective and responsive to the modern condition. Um, so let me do the first question. I might come back to you just for clarity on the second question. Um, the first question, she's entirely right. Um, and in my, to exonerate myself <laughs> slightly, it, 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 is, it is complicated. I think we're at quite an exciting stage in travel writing studies, as we've just heard from JRT, you know, more and more accounts of these other tragic traditions are starting to appear. And, and, and I'm embarrassed to say, but I mean, I, I can't really, I can speak some French, a um, little bit of Portuguese perhaps, but I can't speak really any non-European languages and which is which is obviously entirely my my, my fault but um someone like me needs some to know more about that material in english before i can include it and i would like to include it um and i would say really in the last particularly in the last, certainly this century um we are starting to get the appearance and i'm sure a lot more is happening in, in sort of indian languages in english language scholarship as well as then in, in, in what's been put into english language really starting to get the work that's creating these accounts of other you know, traditions and making them possible so that we, we can factor more of them in. Um, so, so in answer to the first question, yeah, I mean, yes, it would be good to put more in. Um, I suppose my position on that was partly speaking to, I suppose that it is probably fair to say, I would have thought that one of the main drivers towards picking up this interest in travel writing as a genre and sort of theorizing travel writing and and sort of um, writing histories of travel writing you know did start with a sort of post-colonial inquiry into the um, often dodgy nature of western travel writing so that was almost a primary focus so it, so inevitably it sort of started it began with that it focused on that a lot of the scholarship initially was on that but then scholars were saying quite quickly well wait a second you can't if, if, if you you over prioritize those traditions you end up inadvertently creating an image the impression that somehow only the west has traveled when all these other cultures had travel traditions which also need to be um made known uh, worlded if you like um to, to, to sort of counter that and you know and these other traditions will have their own problems but also their own affordances and strengths if you like so so i i, I basically agree with that comment um it would be good to weave more of um, those other traditions in. Um, I would like, in my own defense, I would like to think that some of the questions I raise in particularly in the New Critical Idiom book uh, and sort of the way I've organized it around, not so much just a history of developments in travel writing, but a sort of set of core questions. I would like to think a lot of those questions are relevant to any travel writing tradition, even if I don't know that travel writing tradition to draw an example from, if you see what I mean. Um, I suppose the other thing to say my own exoneration is, is, is you also, um, I suppose many of the other scholars here would have found out, is, is one wants to bring in reference to other traditions, but then one also has to keep in mind one's relative inexpertise. So it's sort of safer to bring in what you're expert in than possibly yeah. to flounder around um, in, ineptly or you know, not appreciating some nuance of a text that's from a very different tradition. Um, this links me to, I think, I, I don't know if everyone was here when I was saying this, I mean, I do have a project taking shape, which would, would try and do something along these lines, which in fact, I don't think anyone could write the one travel writing introduction because you'd need this breadth of knowledge. Um, you know, even just in India, I mean, how many of you have all the knowledge, you know, all the languages to speak all the right. different, you know, and, and, by, and by the time you get to China and these other traditions, um, just this morning, I was noticing that there's a relatively new book out on sort of imperial Chinese travel writing. Um, and so I think what, what, what one would want to push towards in the future is a sort of a constellation of scholars from different traditions trying to produce a sort of atlas of different travel writing. Uh, and that would be really interesting in lots of ways because you, it would th perhaps throw into relief more some of the you know, very colonialist aspects of the Western tradition. But it also might bring out more some of those things that are shared by all travel writing 
whether colonialists or sort of not colonialists, you might, you, all sorts of things that get skewed if we only look at Western travel writing might start to become more clear, clearer if we could have this sort of constellation of scholars working across travel writing traditions and putting like local traditions in dialogue with sort of global traditions and exploring those interactions. So, so yeah, so I'm sort of holding my hand up. I, I agree with the student. Um, and if there is moves to produce a second edition, um, and we have, I have identified with Routledge some areas that need to be addressed. Um, again, how far I feel I would be able to weave in lots of non-Western travel writing without it being a little bit superficial. I'd have to have a think about it, really. I mean, yeah, again, because you have to hold your own hand up. So look, I'm not an expert in such and such an area. So how can I, how can I allude to it? Uh, just one final point. So I, so I, I, I would like to think that with something like the Routledge Companion, I have helped to spur that because one of the things when I um, Routledge approached me to do the Routledge Companion to travel writing, and one of the things I wanted very early on was to try and have some clear chapters at least on other travel writing traditions so that it's not just western focus so um like uh, uh Shivana, who's a friend of mine from sort of we worked on byron together yeah so i know from byron so um commissioned her to do the india one and um, the chapter on african travel writing um arab travel writing if we'd had more space i'd have liked more of those i, I managed to get some japanese travel writing into the pilgrimage chapter so i've, I've tried there more to weave in the other travel writing traditions uh, yeah. And I think if you like the direction of travel in the scholarship is that this is going to get more and more feasible as more studies of the different traditions uh, come into being. Um, so so I, I'd like to, I would very much hope it's, 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 a, it's an extra nuance and breadth that we could start to develop in the field, definitely. What was, what was the second question again? Uh, I, I guess it was from your book. She, she asks travel writing, especially, is travel writing especially reflective of and responsive to the modern condition is something I guess she's picked up from the introduction which you sort of talked about. Yes, well, I, yes, it's, well, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, firstly, in terms of the Western tradition, I think you can say sort of categorically, yes, because there's a massive upsurge in, you know, in a sense, the travel writing genre as a genre comes into being because of the sort of um, you know, that shift in the early modern periods to, to voyaging, to global trade routes. Um, it's a massive boost to sort of uh, Western science and sort of knowledge of the wider world. And in quite complex ways, I think, you know, what becomes the voyages and travel genre before it's ever known as travel writing is very much bound up with modernity and a shaking loose of sort of old, old feudal structures of living and thinking. And so that form is in that form, it, it's, it's very tied up with modernity, I think. I mean, what's interesting, of course, is there, going back to our, our first question, there are, there've always been travel traditions that aren't so tied up with modernity, like pilgrimage. Um, well, pilgrimage is probably the main one. I'd be interested to know what others there are. So, so, so if you like, going back to our umbrella term, travel writing, there are forms of travel writing that aren't bound up with modernity. But insofar as the new Critlidian book, as you've rightly identified, does have a main weighting. So, you know, I think I hold my hands up and say this in the introduction. Don't I? You know, unfortunately, it is mostly weighted on Western travel writing. And I think you can see the connection between travel, travel, travel writing, modernity as being really quite intimate in lots of ways. And fair enough, this is again part of this sort of product I, I'm, I'm sort of trying to put together now, because uh, in the same way that you will see people like Franco Moretti talk about the novel as a distinctively modern genre. Mm. I think there's a case to be said that the travel writing is doing that as well, because travel writing, you know, people suddenly there's an 18th century vogue for traveling. Everyone travels in, in Britain, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. Britain at least. Uh, and that, that traveling is actually training the self in specific ways about time, about diary keeping, about knowledge gathering. Uh, and then it's disseminating out. So it's training its readers in particular ways and, and thinking about a new sense of nationhood. So I think I think that I think you can make the case that the sort of that Western tradition of travel writing that is my main focus. And I'm, all I'm really equipped to talk about is bound up with, you know, again, we might we might want to qualify modernity. You know, there are multiple modernities, aren't there? We now recognise, but you know, what traditionally we tend to label modernity as a sort of Western Enlightenment mm -hmm. set of ideas. Um, and I think I think travel writing has a very integral place in in that sort of mindset. Um, uh, yes, I, I think a question has just come in on the on the same lines. It says. Uh, you know, it asks us how, you know, there's this uh, 
uh, how nationalism defines travel writing in the sense, uh, defining charting uh, the concept. And can we spot a difference with, between pre-nation and post-nation travel writing as it were? Now, how does nationalism have an effect on the power dimension of travel writing is the question. Um, all my thoughts, let me know what I, I suspect there, yes, there will be. I mean, I'm not perhaps again, my own expertise really is sort of 18th, 19th century, but like your own, Amrit. And so, so I'm sort of used to dealing it with the, where you're in the nation forming stage. But I, yeah, I think, I think I've read enough sort of medieval, you know, studies of medieval travel writing, very early on travel. So yeah, there, there are going to be differences there. There are going to be different contexts that you need to factor in. Um, I mean, going back to my point about travel writing modernity, though, again, I think what's interesting in somewhere like Britain and, and a little bit, I know, somewhere like perhaps France in the 18th century is just, if you think of that classic Benedict Anderson definition of nation as imagined community, uh, that massive way, or, and, and actually this is happening early in the Tudors as well, there's a massive wave of sort of topographical works in uh, sort of under Elizabeth in the Tudor period, which are all about starting to imagine the nation as a sort of single entity. And then there's another really big wave in the 18th century. So um, just as I think you can make the case that travel writing then is forming self in new and distinctive ways, I think you can make the case that British travel writing is, is starting to form nation in a new, new and distinctive ways, both sort of under the enlightenment and the, the, the romantic, which is sort of also teaching you about the picturesque, the beauties of the landscape. So, I, so I think I think you can see travel writing playing an important point in nation building. Um, now, now what, how if you think of nationalism as perhaps an extreme form of nation building, I mean, how far it's going to form it or national. Nas yeah, I suppose it's going to, I mean, I'm trying to think of particularly nationalistic travel writers from that period. I'm not sure I know of a lot of it, especially travel writers in that period, but I think, I think you can make the case, sorry, I'm waffling a bit. I think you can make the case that it's, ba it's certainly bound up with the emergence of the nation state in that sort of emerging modern dispensation of the 18th century. Um, how far you want to see them also then co equipped, connecting to actually more sort of hardcore nationalistic. Um, would that be a distinction you reckon? I should, perhaps I should ask you, you know, na nationalism I'm, I'm interpreting here as a sort of quite hard right wing version of sort of nation building. Is that how you guys would recognize nationalism or you recognize it as a slightly more neutral nation building terminology? I, I guess this to uh, Shamarpun has this idea of the more neutral uh, kind of nation building. Right, nation you know, building. Yeah, okay. Well, then no, that case definitely, definitely. Sorry, I, I went off a track because so I was thinking of nationalism leading to sort of Nazism and, and then far right sort of ideologies. Okay. Yeah. No. No. I think I think that I think that's definitely the case. Um, go back to the pre-nation. I mean, I don't know enough about it myself, but I'm you know, it is. I, I know medieval scholars, for example, who have been working on travel, and and they they obviously are working with a very different sort of set of context in the sense that often you have, you know, literate elites that only nominally see themselves as part of countries. You have, you know, what we now think of a countries are often much more dispersed, you know, so Britain is multiple countries, mm. it's the north. Yeah. So so actually that travel writing there makes is subtly different when you're you haven't got the same set of nation states organizing themselves in contradistinction to each other. One of the factors that we could probably think about is the impact that is, it has on uh, places like India, for example, where mm. you know, travel to the West also generates a kind of you know, an, a familiarity with ideas of nationalism, nationhood, sort mm. of is brought back by travel into uh, the prominent discourses, political discourses of the period. So, you know, uh, it's it's interesting in the way you know apart from Western uh, discourses on the nation and you know Partha Chatterjee for example has talked about nationalism in India as being a derivative discourse. So travel mm. is part of that derivative discourse, I guess, in a way in which it brings back uh, the idea of the nation uh, to to uh, places like India, I guess, to countries like India. So uh, within the subcontinent. 
Yes, and that's very interesting, yes, because you mentioned Tagore and people, I mean, many of those travellers, and I've, I've read some of the studies of sort of Bengali travellers coming to Britain and, and to Europe, uh, and I've read similar studies actually of Arab travellers coming as well, and often they are coming, go back to the question about modernity, specifically because they can obviously see the material power that this right. modernity generated in Europe has created, so they are going and they are sort of surveying it and bringing back, so so on the one hand, there's travel there to sort of equip themselves, learn more about certain sort of modernity, and then I've never looked into this, but you, you may know more Amrit than your students, I'm sure know more. I've always assumed that presumably that casts into relief uh, through a process sort of contradistinction, what links the different communities of India, because obviously India is a massively diverse place. So it, so it must have ha uh, played its part in creating a new national idea of India, presumably in, in complex ways. Would, would that be fair to say? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Uh, in a way in which, you know, it's defining itself uh, from its earlier existence to a kind of new, you know, post-colonial kind of a kind of a phenomenon, as a fair. Yes, and 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 again, we come back to this sort of imagined. This is, I mean, I, I say I, there's, a, there's a project taking shape uh, in my head, which is thinking about travel writing of producing imagined communities and sort of modern nation states, where I think you know travel writing helps you imagine the state. You know, mm -hmm. and, and actually, a lot of that 18th century travel writing is very nuts and bolts. You know, what you know. Where, where, are the, where are the minerals? Where are the woods? Where are the practical things we need to do stuff? And then if you could lay it on top of that, arguably is the sort of more, more romantic travel writing, which then says, okay, let's also then imagine our nation state as um, this wonderful place with myths and sort of uh, cultural complexity and picturesque scenery. So that sort of in the enlightenment and romantic really sort of aren't pulling in different directions, if you think of it that way, they are sort of layering different ways of conceptualizing the nation on top of each other. And I suppose what would be interesting about one of the things I was struck by when I did my my Gian, um week in Bhubaneswar, it was was you know I went to a, a local bookshop and picked up you know, the English language in, Indian travel logs, and it, there definitely seemed to be an explosion there of if you like more sort of lightweight, um, easy going travel travel writing by sort of middle class writers touristically traveling around India, which must be doing something. So I've got one on the shelf called the Heat and Dust Project by a, by a young Indian couple. And that, uh, so that's all helping to create a sort of like a, a middle class imagining of India as an entirety and set of connections. That must be, you know, it, it, it's quite lightweight, it's quite literary, it's, it's very engagingly written. It's not the big <laughs> survey like sort of some 18th century travel writing, but it, it's helping to create that imagined community, presumably. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, the next question then comes in from uh, one more student of ours, and uh, she, she's asked, given that globalization, cosmopolitanism, and digital culture have encroached into the process of travel, how do you see travel texts emerge in the, in the future? What, what exactly is, you know, although that's speculative to a certain extent, but what exactly is travel writing going to be like? <laughs> uh, ooh, blimey. That's a different question. I mean, I'm not sure I can predict what it's going to be like. Um, insofar as I have sort of organized thoughts around that, I mean, Ranch Companion, for example, has a, I, I commissioned a chapter on blogging, because mm. you know, obviously mm. blogging is a very new medium. And, and um, so, so, so I suppose, first try to identify what's new. I suppose there, there, are, there are greater facilities now than there have ever been for a sort of immediacy in reportage you can be in the place and people the other side of the world can almost instantly read what you're saying mm -hmm. in that place there's just really immediacy reportage i suppose the other thing that is new is the scope for virtual travel has also escalated so you can you can go around places kind of on google maps and mm -hmm. no doubt other things um so where that is going to take us I'll let that question tick away in the back of my mind while I say some other things. I suppose one first thing though I would want to say to that is, you know, it emerged from the emerges in the chapter on blogging uh, that Kylie and um, a co-author whose name popped out of my head wrote, is that in many ways those new media, as far as I can see, do just uh, return us to perennial questions about travel writing, as if, as if the, the perennial sort of problem or the is is still just the same. Mm -hmm. uh, in some ways, which is, you know, um, the blog seems to betoken a certain sort of authenticity. You're actually there. You haven't gone through a publisher. There's not a time delay. 
but often blogging platforms impose their own structures um push you into a format mm. so the same as everyone else's so in effect there's, there's this continual tension between sort of your authentic individual responses and the fact that a, a, a variety of sort of industry publication type mechanisms are structuring your response uh, and that's even before you get to the fact that you will be, as, as, a, as a spectator you are structured by the larger discourse that's shaping your ideas so i suppose one answer to that is to say that many of the perennial debates around travel writing and functions of travel writing haven't gone away even with the new media the new media just sort of puts a new spin on them mm. Uh, and it's worth thinking about virtual travel. In a sense, virtual travel writing, uh, or the, vir the virtual travel allowed by something like Google, Google Maps, uh, uh, Google the Street thing, is, is, is again just a sort of slight heightening of what people have been doing for, for actually centuries. Remember, you know, travel writing is a sort of virtual travel. Uh, the bringing back of specimens so that people could look at stuff was a form of virtual travel. The recreation of things like. Um, Models, models. Mm. Belzoni set up, mm. uh, you know, mimics of the, 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 the new pyramids he found. You know, that's mm. you know, that's virtual travel. By the early 19th century, you had panoramas, so you could go into mm. these enormous um, semi-circular spaces that recreated the whole scene around you. Or you could do a diorama, which is a moving one. And so I think there was one of Bombay, for example, in the mines it is now. But you could go and see in, in sort of 1820s London what it was like to actually be getting off the dock. I can't remember where it was in, in, in Mumbai that they, they set it up. So in a sense, these are just continuing um, continuing developments that are always there. I suppose what occurs to me also thinking about those, I suppose the I suppose the ramping up of virtual travel, I've, I have read some interesting stuff about the way what that tends to do though is prioritize vision and possibly sound over the other mm. senses. So mm -hmm. there's been some interesting work on senses in travel. Charles mm. Forster, for example, I think has written about this. And of course, you know, if you're if you if you are seeing a certain sort of virtual travel as a replacement for real travel, but it's, it, you lose those intimate senses that you get from being like mm. smell, taste, touch. There's an interesting set of debates around that. Um, I suppose the blogging. It, one of the things that blogging does do is. It because it takes out the sort of gatekeepers of the publication industry, is it does contribute further to the diversification of travel. You know, anyone can be a travel mm. traveler. Anyone can put it up there. I suppose that helps in terms a, a more splintered sub communities of travelers who will, who just know each other because they, they've got particular interests or connections. So I suppose you've got a splintering there, just as you perhaps we have in many TV uh, things now. Mm. We have multiple mm. channels. You can have a sort of multiple communities. So I can. I've, Thinking it through, I can see that that's something. If like the the amateurishness that was has often been a part of travel writing tradition, has been ramped up by blog culture and Instagram right. culture. Mm -hmm. um, but as we feel like many of the many of the fundamental questions and purposes stay the same. I've just marked, for example, one of our MA students wrote a very interesting travel piece. Uh, about Instagram culture in travel and her sort of framing of it was the way Instagram culture, I suppose, led to dissatisfaction because she, the sort of premise of the piece is she goes traveling and then even when she says goodbye to anyone, it doesn't seem like the big emotional occasion that you, she's seen friends mm -hmm. do on Instagram. Mm -hmm. So she's constantly, um, constantly feeling she's not doing what an Instagram type traveler would do, <laughs> mm -hmm. even as she's Instagramming her travel. So I suppose, I suppose, I suppose that's ramped up, I suppose, that sense of it was always there, you know, travellers always have gone out with a model or a script that prior travellers have um, provided. But I suppose social media just amplifies it, makes it perhaps more intimate, um, more connected to every moment of our daily life, that script. So, um, that's, I, I mean, so not, not areas you will tell, not area I know massively lots about, but I think that those would be some of my reflections on it. Right. In fact, you've already answered one other question, which has come in about, you know, documentaries and film mm. studies making its uh, encroachment into literary studies and whether, you know, uh, documentaries on travel should be taken as travel texts and whether their critical tools would have been the same. But I think you've more or less sort of talked about them uh, uh, while discussing the issue of blogs and Instagram. Yes, and I, I think like the starting point we had was this sort of between travel writing as an umbrella term and then the different mm. subgenres within it mm. obviously overlap and intersect. Yeah, and, and I think clearly the travel writing documentary is a 
is in that loose sense a major mode of travel i think now you know and and it, and, it, and it will share many formal and generic features with a sort of you know and an classic narrative written account but it will also have its own distinctive features that need to be factored in you know, the primacy of visual images over written narration and so forth but yeah you know, much of it will stay the same you know many travel documentaries are are essentially narratives so you're talking about narrative structure across different media um there can be an annoying tendency sometimes or sometimes an effective tendency in tv documentaries to have a journey in the media sense. Do you, are you familiar in sort of Indian TV culture? In, in British TV culture, certainly, you hear producers often a lot, they want to see the presenter go on a journey. And they don't mean a physical journey, they mean a sort of emotional development. Um, so you'll often, you know, there's a particularly rather naff, um, not often terribly good branch of travel documentary in, in the UK, certainly, where you will put a, a minor celebrity in a very alien environment uh, and then it's so there's been a literal journey so you uh, but then often what the producer you, you know they want is they, they want a journey in this metaphorical sense where roughly three quarters of the way through four fifths of the way through the, the celebrity has a bit of a breakdown bursts into tears <laughs> realizes i don't know she's enormously privileged or something and then she comes out the other side and you know so all that narrative structuring is like what happens in certain textual travel logs as well so, so yeah, so, so they're, they're separate, but, but similar. If, <laughs> if that... Interestingly, Carl, you know, uh, I was just reminded of uh, the elections of India, which have just, you know, been concluded in my state of West Bengal. But mm. uh, when it took place across India, you know, you had these anchors, well-known anchors from TV stations traveling mm. to, you know, distant parts of uh, India, uh, you know, soaking in a bit of travel and then talking to the people. So the ways in which travel writing and you know, travel documentation is now interacting with, uh, say, real life uh, television journalism and mm. the political is, is something very interesting to find in the way in which travel is sort of creeping into various other forms and the structuring that you talk about is mm. being questioned and extended as it were. Mm. Right, right. No, 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 definitely. And, and of course, you know, travel writing and journalism stroke reportage has always been a, you know, that's, that's a, a, a fuzzy border there you know, mm. you know some mm. types of travel writing are very much uh reporting you know um a classic account perhaps is um my mind's done a blank but the there's the famous account of uh what was happening to sort of yamamami tribes people that helps launch uh survival as a as a charity in the 60s where you know some of the atrocities and suffering there and that's essentially a sort of uh it was a i think from it was an observer or sunday times set of articles that becomes a, a travel book so you know so there's always been a strong crossover at one side of travel writing with journalism so some journalism is very much travel writing yeah definitely right uh, i have an interesting question from uh, somebody who does not want to be named he <laughs> asks that you know uh, in in many cases you see uh, and she's questioned my course as it were she said yep. that you know uh, travel is a luxury that uh, you know uh, not everybody can afford, especially mm. people from uh, and uh, India being divided into sort of classes and castes, as you uh, will know, that, uh, you know, travel as such a course in uh, travel writing is uh, therefore uh, almost an elitist insult to, uh, you know, studying uh, literature, as it were. And my friend, your, our mutual friend, Srinath, has asked this question also in a different way. Mm. He asks whether it's it, it is an elitist uh, academic discipline, as it were. So, how would you react to that question? You know, uh, in the way in which the course itself is, in many ways, seen as exclusionary. Um, yes. Well, it, I get another very great question. Um, I suppose, like most of my answer, the answer would be a sort of a yes and a no. Um, if we come back to that umbrella concept of travel writing connected with the sense that then there are sort of plural multiple subgenres sort of intersecting overlapping within the umbrella of travel writing then i think one would want that umbrella term to include um you know migrant accounts um refugee accounts um the, these need to be woven into travel writing these are forms of travel there needs to be sort of some recognition that um works produced uh, that come out of that experience um 
need more, more publicity, perhaps need more circulation, and themselves are a type of travel writing. So, you, so, so I would agree entirely. There is a, um, or, or I'm disagreeing here. I'm saying the travel writing term overall ought to be able to encompass not just the privileged forms of travel, but also all these other forms of travel because they are travel. Travel, travel, I suppose, is a sort of complex signifier in a way, isn't it? It, 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 it? On the one hand, it means neutrally any sort of movement. It has a neutral sort of meaning, and but it also it would be wrong to deny that it has a history of suggesting also slightly privileged travel uh, and I think many of the theorists I know I mean myself included would want to try and get travel back to that neutral sense it means all sorts of mobility uh, so mobility and, and you know then there's been growing work on mobilities in all sorts of forms mm. you know mobilities among sorry, not fully abled communities um, mobilities among marginalized communities and there's been a whole sort of drift to try and feed that in um, but you are quite right. On the other hand, you know, if like there is a strong sort of historical momentum or weighting towards it being um, an account that connects with privilege, you know, historically some of the main accounts, you know, to make them, you had to be quite privileged to do it. You often are reinforcing prep patterns of privilege by what you report back. Um, you are, you know, you're in the colonial context, you're often quite, quite literally, quite directly sort of repetuating. So I, th I think I think there's no denying that. I, I mean, I would say that the, but whether the discipline is, I think whether the discipline is elitist, because actually travel writing studies as a discipline was, I think one of its main stimulus, stimuli, if you like, was post-colonial studies and the idea to mm. unpick mm. the privileging. So I think um, you'd want to distinguish back between the discipline and the genre. The genre is undoubtedly sort of privileged. The discipline, I think, has generally tried not to be. It's tried to generally to be sort of exposing of privilege and to counter privilege um, and to, if you like, reveal those layers of privilege that are in the genre, uh, counter them, expose certain fallacies. Uh, and you know, even so far as you know, someone like Debbie Lyle, who perhaps articulates one of the most sort of extreme versions of travel writing, she just sees, coming back to one of our earlier questions, she just sees travel writing as intrinsically bad because of those sort of imbalances of power we talked about before. So I suppose the travel travel writing studies as a discipline has a, has has tried to unmask and unearth and foreground those mechanisms of power and prejudice that are tightly woven to the genre. Whilst also going back to our earlier question discussion trying to acknowledge that that isn't necessarily always all that travel writing has done. There have always been sort of counter discourses, counter travelers. There has always been, um, a, you know, there have always been attempts to sort of uh, counteract the more pernicious tendencies of travel writing. So it's a more ambiguous field. And perhaps there is, particularly when you start acknowledging the different travel writing traditions from different mm -hmm. cultures, there are other modes of travel, travel writing, which aren't bound up with the same sort of patterns of power and prejudice mm -hmm. in the same extent. So I, I think looking at Srinath's question at the top of the chat there, I think I'd probably want to distinguish between travel writing as a genre and travel writing studies as a discipline, um, whilst also acknowledging that I think he's quite right that um, you always have to be wary as a sort of a dis studying, doing travel writing studies that it can be that you start to just forget about those more marginalized forms of travel. I mean, I think there needs to be a sort of conscious moment to often to weave those in to um, comment on and to reflect that they're there. Uh, just, uh, in my head, I suppose, is a little example of this is, so one thing I've written fairly recently is, um, well, two things I've written fairly recently, is um, a, a chapter for a big collection on Byron and travel, and uh, mm. the chapter in Tim Young's and Nandini Das's um, Cambridge History of Travel Writing on 19th century travel. And there, yeah, there I think I was, following the sort of direction of travel in the field by wanting to stress that what you need to keep in mind for the travel writing period is not just the explorers, the, the things that everyone knows about, but you know, the, the, the patterns of the middle passage at the start of the, you know, for much of the century, mm -hmm. that those, those other patterns of coerced and forced travel, mm -hmm. they need to be seen as part of the same package, even though mm -hmm. um, I think then Tim slightly maybe edit some of it out because it was happening in another chapter, but I was trying to, I was trying to put it in. Um, uh, you always hit constraints of space with these things, but you know I think there's a, the field is trying to recognise that travel needs to be seen as you need to be we need to be factoring not just the privileged forms of travel, but also the, all these other forms of travel as well. So it's a sort of perhaps a slightly woolly answer, but hopefully that 
connects with with some of those points. Right, uh, uh, Carl. Uh, one of our students and now is faculty at a sister university of ours, Rafat, is teaching a course on uh, pilgrimage. Mm. Right. So uh, he's asked, how does travel writing as a label, even as an umbrella term, uh, influence modes of seeing or knowing the world outside in non-Western traditions, particularly or originating with religious motives? Is there a room for dialogue between faiths under this generic form? Oh, well, I would hope there's a room for dialogue. I say, I mean, this, is, this is this proud product that's taking shape. It's trying to put these different modes in uh, dialogue. Um, let's think about the first one. I mean, clearly, yeah, clearly, I mean, is this going to sort of answer the rest of the question? Pilgrimage has been, you know, people are studying pilgrimage. People are, you know, there's, there's a good um, strand of travel writing studies that recognizes pilgrimage as a as a, you know, an actual practice and also then as a metaphorical motif that runs through travel writing. So you can't really, I think, talk about take any sort of broad view on travel and travel writing without factoring pilgrimage in. Um, in and this is going to make a slightly soon thing, but I suppose in many ways, certainly in many, certainly in the Western, in Western culture, and I, and I get a sense in several other cultures as well, it's almost the foundational mode of travel, really, because often people aren't traveling initially, um, or it's a found, certainly a prominent foundational mode. And then, of course, it goes on even as other modes develop to provide a sort of set of framing metaphors and motifs that other modes will use. So, you know, your modern tourist, I've just been marking another very interesting MA, trying to understand, if you like, forms of sort of literary tourism and touristic travel writing as secular pilgrimages. So sort of pilgrimage lives on in many different mm -hmm. guises. Um, and sometimes you can say it genuinely lives on, and sometimes perhaps it's just a sort of slightly spurious uh, bid for respectability that some rather more cynical types of travel writing put on. So I'm thinking of something like Sir Walter Raleigh, who, um, uh, who's really just going to South America, to Guyana to make money, as well, you know, find gold and, and to get back in Queen. You know, so it's, it's not really a very honourable set of motives he's got. They're quite sordid. But he wants to construct it as a pilgrimage because that sort of is a sort of more venerated and respected mode of travel in his own time. So... Um, so yeah, there needs to be a dialogue. I think there needs to be recognition of pilgrimage as one of the motifs, uh, and, not, and not just motifs, one of the sort of foundational motivations. Um, I'm probably not massively equipped to, to know more about that dialogue myself because I haven't really worked on pilgrimage, but yeah, pilgrimage accounts are there, you know, and I suppose thinking back to an early question about trying to sort of rescue travel writing from the idea that it, it whilst it's often associated with power and prejudice and all those things, it need, does it need always to be associated with that? I suppose pilgrimage can be a way of, you know, reminding us of some of these other motivations and modes of traveling that perhaps are more respectful. So, and that perhaps has sort of useful environmental dimensions to it. This is mm. just taking shape in my head. What's popped in my head now is that you may or may not know in India, but there's been a very popular here for about a decade now has been a sort of type of, a, a, a genre it's very commercially successful known as the new nature writing and the new nature writing it's been a lot of discussion about in many ways it's sort of travel writing but it's travel writing around the british isles uh, and like a lot of genres it's a commercial sort of construct it's you, there are things we could talk about which are problematic about it but one of the things i think that is good about it and that makes it the new nature writing is it is trying to marry a sort of scientifically informed environmental awareness of aspects of the British Isles with a sort of quasi pilgrimage sense of, you know, you, you need to go, you need to immerse, you need to lose a purely analytical mindset, you know, that, that is about trying to sort of change consciousness, change certain attitudes to being in nature. And I think you can see that as that's an updated pilgrimage idea. That's something we can perhaps take from pilgrimage from the future is a sense of this more mindful, respectful way of being in the world in certain places. That will often perhaps you know it, 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 will, it will play out differently in different religious traditions and different pilgrimage traditions but a sense of a sort of seriousness and thoughtfulness in travel is not a bad sort of thing to be trying to think about for all of us when we travel even if we don't consider ourselves if we consider ourselves as very secular travelers so that's a lot of again slightly 
perhaps talking around the question, but that's what comes to mind. And, and, and the basic point is, yeah, there should be dialogue between these different modes and it would be great to get more of those dialogues happening in a sense of um, what is the intersection between a certain sort of, if you like, uh, information gathering, travel writing, and a certain sort of perhaps more reverential pilgrimage style travel and travel writing. Uh, interestingly, uh, Carl, uh, uh, one of the one of the texts that we've included this time hmm. is by uh, a writer called Ruskin Bond, one of the more uh, you know uh, very well known writers of India, who, hmm. who is a Christian by faith, but he he's located himself in uh, in Dehradun, which is in the Garhwal Himalayas, and hmm. he's got this text which is all roads lead to the Ganga. The Ganga, of course, is the major river in India. Hmm. And he's writing about these Hindu uh, places of pilgrimage and he's visiting them and he's looking at, looking at the way in which the river forms the kind of a link between uh, the various nature, natural flora and the fauna. So it's, mm. a, it's an interaction with nature, yet mm. in the sense that he's observing, as it were, uh, from outside the sort of uh, sphere of the internal pilgrimage structure, how, you know, uh, very cleverly, you know, pilgrimages and uh, consciousness of nature have very often interacted with each other. So mm. uh, while you're talking about these new newer kinds of pilgrimages uh, that are being written about in travel, I thought that that would have been a very interesting point. Mm. Mm. Well, it's, yes, because I suppose what it connects with, um, making the connections now, is, is um, again, so you and many of your students may be familiar with the sort of the work that's been done around notions of space and place and the way in which, if you like, our encounter with spaces that turns them into places if you like so we go from just a sort of neutral terrain or whatever it is but we turn a space into a place by naming it imagining it weaving stories around it um, and and it's like a whole environmental consciousness and moves it doesn't just happen because we're in a place in some sort of bold way it's because we are project onto it we interact with it a complex dynamic set of exchanges happens and I suppose that sort of space place thinking you can see woven into the new nature writing. And it is, again, it's, a, it's part of what it's trying to do when it does it, when it works well, is trying to think, you know, rethink our connections, our emotional affective connections with places. And to sort of, if you like, to, to acknowledge that they are important, they, they, you know, they, they shape the histories of places, they shape us. Mm -hmm. And it's not just a sort of simple scientific interaction between us and a the place. There's, there's these complex layerings of culture, emotion, and I suppose thinking about pilgrimage in many ways is um, it's a motif, it's a tradition that perhaps connects more with that sort of emotional affective side of travel than some of the more sort of scientific exploration strands of travel do. I don't know, it's interesting, I haven't really thought about it. I'm just, this is why these discussions are so, so interesting. <laughs> I'm just thinking that through my head there. Uh, uh, Shubham Dutta, one of our students asks, uh, you know, he's, he's wondering whether, you know, all life, uh, all, uh, Life writing is essentially travel, you know, in the way in which you know, journey through life and whether and how travel writing and life writing interact. Um, yes. Um, again, we, we hit, of course, you know, our starting point. As I said, it's always the starting point with travel writing is how exactly do you put the limits on it? And I think, of course, you know, for one level, you know, any piece of travel writing and life writing interact quite a lot. Uh, and there is a sense, particularly if you're going to open up travel writing to those more metaphorical senses of life as a journey, life as a mm -hmm. set of stages, mm -hmm. then almost all life writing becomes uh, travel writing. Uh, having said that, I myself, come back to this sort of pluralistic sense of multiple travel writing journals, I prefer to see, to be sort of more precise in my mind about the different ways in which travel writing can become life writing and almost to see sort of different sorts of overlap between the genres. So for example, you know, if you're working with this idea of any piece of travel writing as being a supposedly non-fictional account of a segment of someone's life, it's a sort of, you know, you've got a sort of piece of um, end limited travel writing, uh, life writing that happened, you know, here is an episode in my life. But, so that's one sort of way in which it's life writing. On the other hand though, there is definitely some sorts of travel writing in this perhaps comes in with the, the development of more literary types of travel writing really in the 20th century, where what the writer is doing is they are using a journey or perhaps a series of journeys to really not just talk about their life in, during those journeys, but to frame the whole life up to that point. 
So if you like, so that that's a more, if you like, intense, um, uh, substantive interaction between the genres. So there are definitely, so something like um, uh, Jenny Diskey's Skating to Antarctica. The framing device is a journey where she's on a sort of cruise ship going to Antarctica, but it, that's very much the thing where you pack a whole autobiography of yourself into the journey. So, so, so travel writing in that mode is definitely, you, you've got a very strong interaction between the two. The journey is the framing device for a piece of life writing. So that's, that's what you could call, I suppose, a very substantive, strong overlap. Then you have these weak overlaps where you could say, well, okay, someone went from here to here and it took them six months. So insofar as they're telling you six months of their life and revealing bits about themselves, it's a sort of weak life writing, travel writing interaction. So you get these sort of, so you're always going to get these uh, different degrees of interaction. So there's a very strong part where it's very strongly linked. So like, you know, Elizabeth Gilbert's Eat, Travel, what to Eat, Love, Pray, or Eat, Pray, Love, I can't remember which one eat, it is. Be love. <laughs> eat, Pray, Love, that's it. Yeah, that's quite, you know, so that's again, a bit like the disky. that's quite a strong interaction. She's traveling to different places. Um, perhaps, whereas the disky sits just on side of the travel writing board of the, intera- of the overlap, um, the, the girl that sits just on side of the life writing, but you can see the two forms are really integrated there. But there can, there can be other, if you like, other, other forms where the, the integration is more implicit than explicit between the two. All right. And I think it can, it can be useful to make that distinction, I think. Right. We have one question here which asks about uh, the ways in which the flourishing of uh, tourism as an industry <laughs> uh, somehow diluting the narrative quality of travel and how uh, you know the tourism industry shapes the way in which travel narratives are now constructed. Mm. Uh, yes, well, I suppose this is a, a long-standing debate in the field. And I suppose a first thing to say about it is that some of the people who help sort of launch travel writing studies and thinking about travel writing academically, uh, like I think of Paul Fussell or Fussell, I'm not quite sure. You can actually name it with a broad, very good, very good book. Um, but sort of it's got, it's got these, I think a lot of people feel now these slightly theoretical flaws to it as well. Uh, and one of those flaws I would say is that Fussell, if you sell, buys very strongly into some, into a sense that there is somehow a very clear distinction between sort of inferior tourists mm. and superior travelers, which is a distinction you start to get really in the 19th century, just as, as tourism started to sort of become a more of a mass pursuit uh, really in the early decades of the 19th century. And because of that, he sort of then tries to draw all these very strong distinctions between the tourist and the traveller and the quality of touristic travel writing versus sort of more literary travel travel writing, traveller travel writing. Uh, and I think quite quickly, some, you know, slightly more weighty scholars than, than Fussell got into that. Uh, people like James Buzard, very good book called The Beaten Track, some of you may know. Um, Jonathan Culler has a good article chapter on the semiotics of travel. And it's not really a distinction you can sustain very well. You know, all travelers are shaped by certain sorts of infrastructure, um, both in the traveling and then in the writing. All, um, all travelers are having things usually mediated to them to some degree when they go out in the world. So it's, it's not really a sharp distinction. So I think that's the first point to say about that. Um, more generally, of course, it is true that the the growth of what you could loosely call recreational travel tourism from the late 18th century onwards does start to boost the amount of travel writing. Um, you could see it, I would suggest, as one of the factors that definitely leads to the emergence of more literary strands of travel writing. Because once you have people going to places where loads of people have been before, you, there's no need to just bring back a factual account. You know, you've got to find some sort of you know, personality style that says you know, it's, it's, and, I, and it's a shift I think you can see very clearly in Dickens for example if you look at Dickens's um, um, notes from America I don't know I've got I can't the title but his first his book about America is very if you like old traditions of travel writing here is lots of factual reportage if you go to pictures of Italy and Italy of course by, the, by Dickens's time in the 1840s has been written about hundreds and hundreds of times he's aware that you don't need information. Uh, he has a nice line saying, you know, if you want to know how tall this cathedral is, uh, go and look in Murray's handbook. He's got all the measurements. <laughs> so what he's doing then is actually, I will therefore produce, a, and it's a brilliant literary work of literary travel writing about sort of meditating on memory, 
uncanniness, strangeness in places. So in a sense, that touristic travel helped to bring about, I think, this more literary, romantic style of travel from the 19th century. So in some ways, you could say it actually improves the, the literary quality of travel writing in its early stages. Having said that, of course, you do then, you know, as the travel tourism industry ramps up, becomes more all-encompassing, of course, it is always a factor that needs to be thought about is how far, you know, is any traveller going to a place and, and if you like getting their own perceptions or getting to the truth of authenticity of places, how far are they just um, seeing things that the tourist industry has set them up to see, you know, that, so they're getting mediated experiences. Um, George Monbiot, I don't know if he's a writer well known in India, but he, he, he he's a sort of political columnist now, but he, his early works were travel writing and he He's got a very good book about uh, Kenya and the Maasai and the Maasai Mara, and he, he, it really brought home to me when I first read it how far the tourist industry can leave certain places, certain communities, sort of hostage to their own postcard images. Mm -hmm. You know, they have to perform themselves. As um, he paints a very good picture, of the Maasai Mara, sort of some, some Maasai communities can't almost maintain their traditional life ways. They have to sort of perform them inauthentically for tourists. That's how they make a living, and you can see that dynamic happening in, in coastal towns in this country, in Cornwall, and I'm sure it happens in India. I'm sure there are parts of India that are sort of um, like held hostage to both international tourist perceptions and probably intra-national tourist perceptions. So yes, yeah, so, so, I mean, the tourist, tourism industry impinges on things. It, 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 it shapes things. It dis can distort things. So I think one needs always to be alert to that. The idea that there is a sort of single tourist experience that can be set against a more authentic experience is a much more problematic claim. I think one needs to, you know, tourism has been shaping things for centuries. Would be would not ask for that. I think you mentioned Dickens. Uh, Stern mm. would have been another example. You know, the way with which you know the sentimental journey sort of turns upside down the whole idea of the grand tour. Exactly. Yeah. 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 No, def 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 definitely. Um, so I didn't mention that. I suppose I mean Stern is sort of still presenting sentimental journey as a fiction, though, isn't he? Pr sort of prim mm. primarily. Whereas by the time you've got to Dickens, something that is actually marketed as this is actual travel, factual travel writing, mm. now mm. has taken on those Sternian mm. dimensions of mm. let's let's just explore the self, yeah. the, the personality, the, the character. Yeah. Uh, Kiron has a question from the southern part of India, and she asks: uh, To what extent can the mode of travel? play the role of a decisive tool while analyzing travel narratives? Um, well, obviously, mode of travel, I suppose, you know, thinking before we get to the, the travel writing studies and the analysis, I think the question is, is, is quite right that, you know, one line that travel accounts will go down or like one prominent motif in many, a prominent motif in many travel accounts will be the mode of travel. So, you know, think of, um, Stevenson, Journeys with My Ass, or uh, uh, Journeys with Donkey, sorry, um, or walking, you know, so, so modes of travel obviously transform the experience. And there's been there's a long, rich tradition of writers adopting a particular mode because it will generate a particular set of insights. It will generate a particular set of challenges. Um, Robin Davison, for example, walk, ca traveling by camel and foot across the Australian outback turns it into a different sort of experience um, and different modes of transport. Then if you like, um, if you have different constraints, but also different affordances, if you're familiar with that terminology, affordances, things that they allow, things that they you can happen. So I suppose the walk classic, coming back to pilgrimage ideas, I suppose the walk classically invokes a more meditative experience, you know, the chance for the mind to float three and so you daydream and you wander and you perhaps at an unconscious level think through things in your past. So walking and pilgrimage has a very powerful set of connections. Um, the, the motor car, you get this sort of slightly atomized, distanced, insulated view. There's a windscreen between you. You're slightly away from the smells and the noise. Um, yeah, so different, different modes of transport will, will create different sensory perceptions uh, different speeds, so glimpses versus sustained encounters. So yeah, so so the modes are really interesting. Uh, they can be important motif. It's definitely worth thinking about what uh, not only the constraints, but what a different mode allows and creates. And I go into the studies. I suppose you know, yeah, you know, there have been studies of all these things. There, there are some great studies of walking. 
uh, in different environments and what walking brings to travel and travel writing. Um, I've read over the years great studies, they say car driving, the road journey, the road trip, both as li literal travel writing and then the way, uh, if you like, the, the, road, the road trip becomes a motif in films and fictions as well. Another good example is actually where you can't always draw the dividing line between actual travel accounts and actual traveling and films, because all of them will shape each other. You know, people's actual road trip experiences shape the road trip film genre and the road trip film genre, you know, Thelma and Louise or something, shapes how we play ourselves when we go on real trips. So there's a blurry line there. So yeah, I'm mo modes, modes, of modes of transport, really interesting to think about, really interesting to think about in terms of how different modes of transport perhaps create different senses of place, help us shape places in a different way, create different physical experiences for us, perhaps allow different sorts of psychological journey within us, mm. depending on whether we're walking, whizzing super quick. So yes, a bit, and, this, and I'm, sure again, I'm sure your students know, but there've been interesting studies of speed, of walking, of automation in travel. All these things are interesting dimensions to unpick, definitely. Yeah, Tagore, for example, has this distinction between traveling by the country boat and oh, by okay, the yep. ship. Mm. So, uh, and the time that it takes, the kind of intimacy with the village people that he can have, and therefore a whole range of new travel accounts that come up, you know, rather mm. than traveling by ship, which is slightly more impersonal and, uh, you know, on the seas, as it were, mm. distant in that sense. No, really interesting. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's a distinction that, uh, let's go back to the Tagore and modernity. I suppose in many ways, you can see with, it is a sort of side function, if you like, a modernity that not just to prize speed, but then to also prize nostalgically, romantically, mm -hmm. the, the absence of speed. So yes, Tagore, yes. you can see being a modern figure there. Mm -hmm. And you get, uh, get you know, the slow travel movement. Are people sort of familiar with that in India? It's, it's, a, it's a quite a European, I think it starts in Italy, doesn't it? This idea of slow travel that you're mm -hmm. going and you have slow food so you want your food to be prepared very carefully and, and, and it's in many ways it is characteristically modern because it's a characteristically modern reaction to the modern that you want you want, you want something that sort of valorizes non-modern ways of travel uh, i don't see any any other questions right now for carl so there was a hand uh, but uh, mm. it said uh, the make of a phone rather than an individual. So if, if anybody is interested, you know, you can raise your hand. You won't get such an opportunity to interact with Carl uh, again uh, soon. So uh, any, any other questions? Right. You could unmute yourself and ask if you, if you so feel like. Jyotidi, would, uh, would you like to ask any, any, anything to, to Carl? Uh, um, it was a very interesting discussion because it took us uh, to many places. Uh, but again, you know, it is this uh, very protean uh, aspect mm. of uh, travel that we are looking at. And so if we have to, you know, talk about travel, uh, it, it's important to, you know, uh, uh, think of these subsections into which, you know, we can mm. um, a a actually... Um, uh, what um, direct our uh, thoughts because otherwise you know it's going to become unwieldy and chaotic mm. and anarchic mm. Mm. so so you know that that that's uh, the point uh, so uh, and 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 uh, for indian travel writing uh, uh, carl uh, what i found was unless and until we go by regions to a certain extent mm. languages and regions it's mm. just impossible and then, mm. you know, we can compare and contrast and, you know, that kind of thing. There will be some mm. things which are shared at certain points of time. Uh, but otherwise, you know, it can just get out of hand. I, I agree entirely. Yeah. So um, it, it, you need this sort of sense of a constellation of connecting, sometimes overlapping forms, but they're all quite distinct. And I would say in my own, I suppose I, with my own research, there's almost two strands to it. I've done like the new critical idiom and the Ravage Companion, which I tried to be big overview. <laughs> But in a sense, my own main scholarship, I'm much happier talking specifically about eight, 18th, early yes. 19th century. And even yes. there, within different modes, there's the exploration account, there's the right. picturesque tour account. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, because it has that precision. Uh, I mean, I, I think this, this is, um, and I should be in touch with both of you, Amrit and, and Jyoti, I think shortly about this project 
that I feel is taking shape would be about trying to produce a sort of an atlas or constellation of many of these different types in their local forms that you could put, right. you could put right. together. It would be, you know, because um, it would be, I suspect there are, will be, you know, in India, these you know, regional types that also particular sort of communities within that region. And then, but then there'll be a particular form, a particular type of, right. Right. That perhaps has a, you know, it appears in the 16th century, let's say, and sort of, or, or 13th century, and it has its sort of uh, arc of development and sort of wanes perhaps by the 19th century. But, you know, that, that for 200, 300 years becomes a tradition that had sort of uh, substance and reach in that community at that time. And it would be very interesting to put some of those together, I think, particularly, I mean, I think we're really hitting a point where it'd be great to have more of those non-Anglophone um, accounts discuss and put out there because because you know it is i'm embarrassed to say you know, many of us outside the subcontinent don't speak any of those languages yeah. and there's clearly just masses of material there that people are really starting to think about and unpack and recover that are fascinating and i i think there's a really scope for an interesting project which, which brings i say brings indian travel accounts the, you know we could revisit some of the ones that have been written back quite a lot in the western tradition but then there'll be chinese different traditions mm. um, yes um i was reading something yeah. just this morning about um and Malay accounts of shipwreck and things like that, you know, which I, you know, there is a sort of sub tradition there. Put all those in dialogue, <clears throat> and then of course, of course, you one would want juxtapose. <coughs> sorry, excuse me. <coughs> one could then at some point start to draw out well, what are threads, what are connections, but really just to see them in in, in dialogue with each other, with and next to each other, would be a really interesting project, I think. Mm. Yes. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, yes. One last question, Carl, because I think, uh, well, we've traveled a long way in this uh, discussion, uh, is uh, somebody's asked a question on, uh, no, I think there are two questions. One is on the influence of uh, Gulliver's travels as a, as a, as a major text in, in, in terms of travel writing and in the way in which, you know, it has its influence on uh, postmodern travel writing. Would, would you mm -hmm. like to mm -hmm. comment on that? Oh, uh, just some very general comments because I'm not a great Swift expert, but I thought, yeah, you are right. It's, I mean, it comes out of one of the reasons why, going back to where we had some earlier discussion, didn't we, about travel and travel writing and modernity. One of the ways I, which I think travel, travel writing are much more linked to modernity than sometimes people recognize is um, the emergence of modern, a distinctly modern Western form of travel writing in, 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 in the West at least is very much bound up with things like the Royal Society and the emergence of modern science. But it's also bound up with the emergence of the, you know, this distinctively modern form in many ways, the novel. So, you know, both, you think the two, two of the most seminal novels in the early 18th century are, are, mm. are Robinson Crusoe, mm. which is obviously about, you know, precisely about sort of colonial adventuring and what have you, and um, Gulliver's Travels, which from memory he dedicates to Dampier, doesn't he? He claims it's based on Dampier's um, Voyage Around the World, 1697. Um, yes, yeah, so so it, it comes out, and and what you can see, I think, um, those early novelists are taking from travel writing. Um, off the top of my head, I'm not a great expert in this, but are, are two things. On the one hand, a technique for realism, because the Royal Society's sort of imperative to try and report the world accurately have, have tried to train travellers to just give you sort of reasonably matter of fact statements about you know, what was there, what physically was there, what did it look like, how big it was, and that started to create this sense of if you like, recreating the world textually in more sort of concrete forms. I said. But then linked to that, this, this sort of illusion of realism that travel writing helped to, to gift as a technique to novelists, um, that illusion of realism, of course, then generates questions about, well, what's real and what's false? And it's always been a perennial mm -hmm. question about, you know, how do you believe what you're reading? Is the traveller lying? There's a lovely, I think, medieval expression about, you know, the traveller may lie by license because no one knows. And, it, and you're right, it's that side that Swift's playing with, isn't he? He's playing with this idea of some nonsensical travel accounts and travel accounts that clearly are works of imagination more than real travel. And that, you're right, that then becomes a starting point that will lead, it leads a bit into Stern to some extent, I suppose, sort of kind of, but it leads eventually, eventually to postmodern questionings of this sort of, it's, it's, so Swift stands at the front of that tradition in really interesting ways. I also always think Swift's interesting after mentioning when teaching because he he is also getting at that other anxiety around travel that if you travel too much you will lose yourself and, uh, you will become uh, acculturated to other cultures so what 
you know, in slightly racist 19th century, they talk talk about going native or some of that. And of course, you know, Gulliver by the end wants to live with the horses. <laughs> he can't stand <laughs> his own people. He wants to live in the stables. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's obviously a parody there again of uh, concerns about being a culture, you know, losing your own cultural identity and becoming taking on this sort of more hybrid things that we now often praise, I think quite rightly, but back in the 18th century, they were much more wary about this idea of losing your identity. Um, some of you may know they had the wonderful figure of the macaroni was the sort of butt of jokes in the 18th century. And the macaroni was the figure who'd been to Italy and become too Italianated, which to uh, a certain sort of conservative nationalistic sort of British writer meant you know, becoming too effeminate, too delicate, too, too, too artsy fartsy. <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so, so, so yes, yeah, so he's, so, so he's touching on that as well, that sense of, you know, um, identity loss, identity hybridity that can come through travel. So he's touching on all these interesting themes, and I think he's getting them because he's aware of an explosion of travel writing that opens up these questions about telling fact from fiction, um, uh, possibly crossing cultural borders, and so on and so forth. So it's an inter- yeah, interesting, inter- interesting point as well. Yeah, I always think it's really interesting that you can really see travel writing in that late 17th, 18th century is tied up with both the birth of science in a modern, recognizing modern form, and the birth of the modern novel. Mm-hmm. Huge areas of culture. <laughs> There's one last, last question promise here <laughs> about, uh, you know, the ways in which, uh, you know, a travel writing is a mode of discovering one's root uh, slash identity, especially mm. in the case of diasporic literature uh, mm. uh, and, or, you know, we've had partition literatures where, you know, the country has been divided or when an expatriate is traveling back to his own country, uh, taking refuge in some, some other country. So uh, the ways in which, uh, you know, this kind of travel writing would play with the idea of identity as it were. Oh, no, uh, yes, and uh, definitely. I think, I think that's really interesting. And, and perhaps a particular feature of travel writing in the last 20 years where we live in a much more globalized um, hyphenated as it's sometimes called well there's a lot more people who are so i mean i'm, I'm anglo welsh would be my sort of hyphenated identity those maybe not a massive hyphenation but we obviously have a much bigger british indian community um and yeah that that, that, that sense of you people's um or well, the other nice terminology here you you may all know is between roots spelt double o t s and roots spelt R-O-U-T-E-S, have you come mm. across that sort mm. of mm. scholarship? And I think that's a really nice idea that actually for most of us, it's a sort of dodgy myth to think we only have roots in the double O-T-S sense. All of us really through our families have roots in the other sense as well. You know, we've come to where we are because people have moved around. So I have a Welsh mother and um, an English father and on the Welsh side, a Swedish great grandfather. And, you know, to, and I'm sure all of you will have many similar stories of sort of so yes, yeah, so travel I think can be a really given we have much much more sort of you say diasporic hyphenated identities. Travel can be a very important motif for connecting those parts of one's identity. I think and and you've certainly seen a wave of very interesting travel writing uh, in Britain. I think doing that. So I'm thinking of um, New Sarah Weaver's um, Adventures in Trans Wonderland, which, and, and New Sarah Weaver is a British Nigerian writer. Her father was uh, Ken Sarah Weaver. Some of you may remember, I remember from the news, and I think he was sadly assassinated eventually by the Nigerian government because he led mm. sort of um, uprisings in the sort of the oil rich parts of Nigeria. Uh, and so she, you know, she writes about the interesting experience of going back to Nigeria as British Nigerian, really. So she's, you know, and that sense of being between cultures as well, in some ways, she's all, never felt entirely British, but when she goes back to Nigeria, there are things that connect the things that distance her. Um, another interesting book that um, I set on my travel writing course last year actually is by a guy called Johnny Pitts called Afropeer. And I suppose that's exploring the sort of African dimensions of Europe and how they're, you know, they've always been Africans in Europe and there's always been often long been an African community that you would not know it necessarily. So that is both taking a journey to understand some of his sort of diasporic roots. And I think what you can see Afropeer doing, which is sort of the follow-on for that is also creating a community. I think it's the other thing travel writing can do. It can, it can not only explore community, it can create new communities. It can put them out there and become a sort of anchoring orientation point around which new communities sort of begin to form, if you like. So, so I think uh, Johnny Pitts, I think Afropeer has got a lot of publicity. I think there's an Afropeer website and you can really see it 
becoming the collecting point, the gravitational point for people starting to think through. So his coinage, Afro Peer, is trying to say that there's, there's long been this fusion of African and European. Um, and and it, you know, it, it starts to define, it bring, it, it's not just describing community, it's bringing a community into being by mapping it. So I think, I think as well as letting you trace communities, it can let writers forge new communities as well. I think travel writing um, done well. Right. Thank you, Carl, for your responses. Uh, it's been a, an exhilarating session, really. Uh, so many questions and your calibrated responses. So thank you very much for having been with us uh, on behalf of the department, on behalf of my university and the students. And uh, I'm sure all of them would be extremely eager to meet you in person when you uh, come down to India and let us, you know, let us think. Uh, and and, and I, as you pointed out, if we can really sort of build up an atlas of travel writing mm -hmm. uh, from across the globe, I think then uh, this kind of an introduction would have had uh, a, a, a long standing momentum as it were. Right. So thank you once again. Thanks to the participants and um, for your questions. Thanks to your students, to the students for the interest. And of course, Carl, it's been lovely having you with us. Right. Thank you. Well, can I just thank you as well, Amrit? Yes. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. It's nice to make these connections again. Um, I'm always massively impressed by the intelligence of Indian students. I must admit, the, the, the wonderfully uh, focused, uh, useful, perceptive set of questions as well. So it was a real pleasure answering them. And as you may have heard from some of my rambling answers, you get, you know, the nice thing about this sort of exercise, it gets one's own mind thinking and there are some connections in my mind. I think, oh, that, yeah, that's interesting. I could think of it. So it, I found it very productive as well. And certainly, Andrew, I, I will be in touch, and JRC, I'll be in touch as well about, I said, this other project I'm developing. It might be really nice to talk that through with you guys as well. Right. And all the best with Wales for the forthcoming Euro, Euros here. Yeah, well, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and England, indeed. So yeah, right. And England, of, too. Right. right. You, you see, see how it goes. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.